called a portal vein. And this is the biggest one in the body. The hepatic portal vein is made up of the superior mesenteric vein, the inferior mesenteric vein, and the splenic vein. Those three come together to form the portal vein, which is in the portal triad, which is in the free margin of the lesser opentrum. Same thing as the hepatoduodenal ligament, which is the rhythmus, I mean the adult derivative of the ventral mesentery. This is post-capillary because it, you went from the arteries to the capillaries of the gut, and now you're into the veins. So it's deoxygenated blood, but high in nutrients. So this does not supply blood or oxygen to the liver. What supplies oxygen to the liver? The hepatic arteries. Off the celiac. Now, you see right here, the inferior mesenteric is joining right there at the junction of the superior mesenteric with the splenic. It can actually occur, if this is the portal, there's the splenic, there's the superior mesenteric, it can actually occur anywhere along there. So it's highly variable where it joins the system. But this is called portal blood. It's in the portal vein, it's called portal blood. If the venous blood is in the inferior vena cava, which is illustrated here, it's called cable blood. So you got a portal system, you have a cable system. There are a few places where those two connect the anastomos. One is around your belly button right here. One is back here at your anus. And one is up there by your esophagus. Those are the three main points. It also uh, interconnects with your zygote system, but we don't care about that. The three important points are you have the umbilicus, the anus, the rectum, and around the esophagus. This is where you have portal blood intermixing with cable blood because they anastomose. There are features of portal veins that are problematic. One is portal veins have no valves, so blood can go in either direction. What is that thing? It's my hand. Your chair? Yeah. <laughs> is it coming from your backside? No. Your chair? <laughs> it's um, so portal veins have no valves. Cable veins have valves. You know that the valves of the inferior vein came up? You have valves all along here in, in the cable system. All of the blood from your legs and arms and your body wall is draining into the inferior vein cable. That's all cable blood, right? Portal blood is just coming from the GI tract. In cirrhosis, where the liver is destroyed, it's all fibrous down, the portal blood cannot go smoothly through it. So it winds up backing up in the portal vein. That's called portal hypertension. And in those three places where there's a portal cable anastomosis, you wind up with varicosities because of that portal hypertension. Remember, blood can go either way. So if you're looking at this right here, normally this cable blood is going to go this way, like from the lower esophagus, it's going to go this way. But if it can't get through there, it's going to go back up through there and it's going to wind up dilating all of these veins up here. Same thing happens around your anus, same thing happens around your belly button. We talked about kaput medusa yesterday. That's how you get it. Portal hypertension. Cirrhosis. Varicose veins around your anus or hemorrhoids. 
varicose veins around your esophagus are called esophageal varices. Now the problem with cirrhosis is the liver makes a lot of important stuff. One is it makes all of the vitamin K dependent clotting factors to clot your blood. Vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So cirrhotic people have poor clotting. It also makes albumin. Albumin is your major uh, intravascular protein. If you lose that, then the osmotic pressure, uh, the oncotic pressure changes and if the patient becomes swollen, they begin moving fluid from the intravascular space into the peritoneal cavity. It's a condition called ascites, A-S-C-I-T-E-S, and they can get huge with gallons of fluid in their peritoneal cavity. One way to fix this is to take and, and take the portal vein, you can take the pressure off the portal vein by taking the splenic vein and removing it from the portal vein and tying it into the renal vein. The renal vein is cable. The renal veins drain into the inferior vein cable. That is called a portal cable shunt. Here's the Caput Medusa guy right there. Pretty impressive. These are the superficial veins uh, on the abdominal wall. These are hemorrhoids. There are two types of hemorrhoids. They're internal and external hemorrhoids. If we look at the colon here, uh, there are different pieces and parts of the colon. And we're going to go into more detail on this when we do the, uh, the pelvis. But there's a thing here called the pectinate line. Below the pectinate line, it's somatic. It's, it's keratinized epithelium, you know, just like your skin. Above the pectinate line, it's autonomic. So if you have these dilated veins right here that occur below the pectinate line, being somatic, they are painful. If they occur above the pectinate line, they don't put enough pressure on anything, and they're painless. Internal hemorrhoids are generally painless. External hemorrhoids are painful. We'll go into this in a little bit more detail in the pelvis. Yes, ma'am. So, putting on a microscope, you can see that these no, it's because you've got about uh, 15 pounds of uh, baby sitting on your uh, rectum, and it's just, it messes up the venous flow, um, drainage, along with the weight, so it's very common. Uh, it's probably 98% of pregnant women get hemorrhoids. Now, as soon as the baby's delivered, they go away, usually. Is one of the two percent. I don't know what the actual percentage is. But I, it's, I'm, not, I'm not. No, I'm not asking. You. Okay. This is esophageal varices here. This is a um, endoscopy of the normal esophagus. These are the dilated veins of esophageal varices right here. The problem with these people is that uh, they're eating. Uh, these things rupture. And they start bleeding and because you clot poorly you don't stop the bleeding so you wind up all this blood going into your stomach and after about a cup of blood gets in your stomach that's when you start vomiting so you start vomiting bright red blood and these things can be deadly uh, you bleed out uh, there are different ways to control the bleeding in, like if you're in a rural emergency room or something, you drop a tube down and dilate a bulb on the end of it to try to put pressure on the bleeding uh, varices 
you can put um, a cold probe down to try to the cold will help, hopefully try to squeeze off some of the drink the vessels um, usually though you die um, I think maybe I mentioned last year one of the worst cases I had when I was moonlighting at Blackwell this 32 33 year old woman came in she was an alcoholic raging alcoholic had a couple of little kids throwing up bright red blood uh, couldn't get these things to stop they flew on a helicopter to Wichita they tried to go in and surgically fix it she died on the table so it's just it's hard but I mean that's a this you drop an NG tube down we talk about NG tubes this is where you would drop an NG tube down to um, get the blood out because what you don't want them doing is retching you know because of the blood blood makes you throw up so you don't want them retching because the retching is going to tear more of these things so it's, it's usually not a good thing characteristics of the colon there are three things that characterize the colon you know how you, how you look at colon versus small bowel one is if you look at the small bowel here um, you've got uh, inner circular and outer longitudinal layers of muscle you've got two two layers of muscle in the small bowel inner circular and outer longitudinal but the outer longitudinal go all the way around the the, the thing the, the small bowel that's why it's smooth like that the colon though the outer longitudinal muscles are condensed into three bands there's a band right there those bands are called tinea coli tinea coli and because there are three bands instead of an outer continuous band it, it wrinkles like drapes when you gather up drapes that's where you have these bumpiness to the colon the bumpiness is called they're called hostra and if you look at a doo doo it's lumpy that's because of the hostra and finally there are these fat appendages hanging off of the um, trend to the uh, trend hanging off the colon these things are called epiploic appendices they're just little fatty ear they look like the ear your ear lobes they're yellow fat so those are the three characteristics of the colon if you follow the tinea coli down to the cecum they all meet at the appendix so if you want to find the appendix just identify the tinea coli they're easy to identify just follow it down to the cecum there it is if there's no appendix there they had an appendectomy speaking of the appendix 60 percent of the time it's folded up underneath the cecum the rest of the time it's free floating out here in the peritoneal cavity but the first place you look for the seat uh, the appendix is behind the cecum innervation of the viscera um, I think we probably uh, did well on this the last um, lecture are there any questions about this organization the greater and less greater and lesser leaks you see are diving into the pre aortic ganglia from there they're just going to catch a ride on a blood vessel in terms of the sympathetic I mentioned that the uh, vagus and S234 they find their post ganglionics remember it's at on in or within an organ in terms of the GI tract it's within 
There's a condition called Hirschsprung's disease. It's also called aganglionic megacolon. What happens here, if you look at the colon here, you find within the muscle layers these postganglionic parasympathetic cell bodies, these neurons. In Hirschsprung's disease, these neurons fail to go there. Neurons migrate into the gut as it's developing from the back, from the neural tube. In Hirschsprung's disease, they fail to migrate. These parasympathetic postganglionics, mostly that are related to S234. If you don't have parasympathetic to the colon, you can't defecate. Parasympathetic control uh, peristalsis, homeostasis. So what you wind up with is a aganglionic dead colon. It, I don't mean dead in terms of ischemic. I mean it's lifeless. It doesn't move. And if it doesn't move, then what's in front of it, proximal to it, is going to fill up with stool and air. That's where you get the megacolon. And this little poor kid right here, look at, look at all the gas in the bowel. This is something that becomes apparent within minutes of birth. When you're doing a, a newborn exam in the <coughs> delivery room, remember I said you put your finger in the mouth, make sure the palate is closed. One of the other things you do uh, within the first, usually hour or two, is you note the time that the baby passed its first stool. That first stool is usually black and tarry. It's called meconium. M-E-C-O-N-I-U-M, meconium. If the baby doesn't poop the meconium within the first hour or two, you start getting a little worried. Because these kids cannot defecate. Now to fix this, uh, the only way to fix it is a bowel resection. So this bowel does not work. What you do is, uh, in, in the OR, you uh, remove the uh, colon from the rectum, I mean from the anus, or really remove the rectum. You go up to where you think good tissue is, you take a section of that and look at it under a microscope. If you don't see the, the, what's called myenteric plexus, you got to go higher. And you keep going up on the sections until you start seeing these neurons. Then you know you're at the right place and you can hook it back up. It's not quite that simple, but that's basically it. So when would you use like a cold, like the, the back? No, sorry. Well, that's, the, that, that's part of the not simple. I didn't want to get into colostomies and things like that. This is, we're just going to say, you're going to find the, where the ganglia cells are. Now you have normal tissue. You're eventually going to hook it back up. Okay. Retroperitoneal structures. Um, the only reason I left this slide in here, this is the beginning of the, the um, kidney lecture, but the only reason I left this thing in here was to show you and, and list for you the different things that are primary and secondary retroperitoneal. And I've mentioned several of these uh, today as, as we went along. The things that were behind the, the parietal peritoneum and never were surrounded by it usually have to do with the uh, urogenital system, including the adrenal glands that sit on top of it. The 
abdominal aorta uh, and the inferior vena cava. I do want you to, to look at this today. You don't have to deal with the kidneys, but I do want you to look for big blue and big red. <laughs> uh, notice that the inferior vena cava is, well, you're gonna have to do this to, to find the inferior mesenteric artery anyway in the portal system. But notice that the, uh, the vein is on the right. So that, if you have a, a woman that's third trimester pregnant, and you're gonna put her on her side, you never put her on the right side because the, babe, the uterus will occlude the inferior vena cava, which winds up decreasing the blood flow, leaving the placenta and the baby will die. You always put a pregnant woman on her left side, always. Lymphatics of the area, this is what we talked about the other day. This is thoracile. There's the thoracic duct. There's the opening into the junction between the left internal jugular vein and left subclavian vein. You do have one on the right, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, the, the cadaver group in here has a good uh, thoracic duct. You need to look at that. Uh, over by the uh, cabinets. The, the what? The sulfur corner. Sulfur corner. <laughs> Uh, you will not be able to find the cisterna chile, just to let you know that, unless you follow the thoracic duct all the way into the abdomen, which I wouldn't advise doing. Uh, this is what the, uh, the, the, the system looks like. Here's our um, celiac trunk right there. There's the, the two celiac ganglia. You should be able to find those today pretty easily. You can see the splanchnic coming down, joining them there. This is the pre-aortic ganglionated plexus. You'll see that as a network around the, around the aorta. The muscles of the area of the back here, uh, and the only reason I left this, them in here is because they are associated with the diaphragm. You need to see the parts of the diaphragm. You have the psoas major, it's under the median arcuate ligament. And on top of that is the psoas minor. Not all the cadavers will have psoas minor. It's kind of like Palmaris longus. You might or might not have it. Out here in the, in the uh, iliac fossa, there's another muscle called iliacus. The tendons of these two join together to form the iliopsoas. The iliopsoas is the greatest flexor of the hip. Quadratus lumborum is off to the side. It forms the, the flank back here. From the inside you can feel quadratus. Um, what's this cut of meat? Um, pork? Pork, pork, pork. Yeah, that's the psoas muscle, by the way. Really good. I love that. Um, again, here's the diaphragm. And the reason I left this in here is because this shows you the characteristics of where these vessels are and the, and the hiatus are. The inferior vena cava is the highest because it's at the dome of the diaphragm. The aortic is at the lowest point because it's the back where the diaphragm attaches to T12 and the esophagus is in the middle. This is a uh, aortic aneurysm. Normally the aorta is about um, two to three centimeters wide in the adult. Once it gets above uh, four centimeters, it's an aneurysm. Once it gets above six centimeters, you need to do something about it. So you follow this with um, ultrasounds if you identify it. This is called a triple A. 
abdominal aortic aneurysm, the AAA. When you do a physical exam on the abdomen, what you don't do is just go start pounding on the abdomen because a person could have a triple A and you don't want to go jamming your hand in a deep palpation if that's the thing you're sitting underneath it. So what you do is uh, you feel for the aortic pulse. Uh, so let me have a, have a volunteer. One of you skinny people that... Uh, Taylor got picked on yesterday. You got picked on Taylor. If you'll move down, if you'll lie it down up here. So when you, um, in your physical exam, of the abdomen, the first thing you do, can I see your abdomen? Yes. The first thing you do is inspect, remember who had the, the belly button ring thing? Okay, so, you would, so you're looking for lesions, any uh, tattooing or um, piercings, identify that. Um, you're looking for masses, for pulsatile masses. You don't want this aortic aneurysm to be, if it's pulsing, don't put your hands on it. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna auscultate with your stethoscope. You're gonna listen to the bowel sounds in all four quadrants. Right? And then you're gonna start palpating. Well, one of the things you can do is palpate out the width of the aorta. So when they, we know the aorta bifurcates at the belly button, right? We're gonna go above that. So if you take your hands and carefully just we'll try to go back. Are you ticklish? Yeah. Oh, you're not gonna work. No, okay. Right. Good. So you you take your hands and just push them down like this, and I can feel the pul I can feel her aorta pulsing. You can probably see it from where you're sitting. Now put your put your finger lightly between my finger. Put, go ahead and put your finger just lightly. You feel the pulse. So what you would do is you would start out here, feeling for that pulse. I don't feel it. Move your fingers a little closer together, a little closer together, until you finally feel the the pulse of the aorta. So if I get her, you can look at look at it bound, look at it bounding right now. Can you see it? I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty strong. So her aorta is about that wide, which is fine. If I feel the pulse and it's out here, stop <laughs> and get an ultrasound. Okay? okay? Of course, the bigger you are, the more rounder you are, the more difficult it is to feel the pulse. And that's all for exam three. Christmas. Is that, yeah. Is that